everyone and welcome back. I wanted to give you some updates this week on student issues related to DE learning. And these are three specific updates that came out of some recent conversations on campus, um, some things happening in Senate, some things that uh, Treva and Allie talked about in some of our campus meetings and email communications. So I thought it'd be a good time just to get some updates on these issues. And as always, if questions come up or if there's a lot of interest in getting some trainings on these, we can certainly have additional conversations and work on some trainings in particular during the Tuesday teaching talks. So let's jump into these three issues now. The first of these relates to just giving a reminder to all of you about FERPA issues and class recordings. So at the end of September, I did a video that talked about some issues coming up in Zoom. In particular, if you are wanting to record a class lecture of a live Zoom session that involves st students appearing in any of your class recording, it could be images of them, videos, it could be their names on the Zoom gallery view, it could be um, personal information that might show up if you are, for example, sharing um, a live video of a class discussion that shows the images of the students in Canvas or shows your roster. At any level, if you um, are deciding to use that same video in a class, let's say next quarter or even a year from now, there could be FERPA violations involved in sharing that video again if you have likeness or any personal class information shared about your students. So what I really recommend to you is to take a look at this video. It's time indexed as you see here, fairly lengthy, but I think it gives a good opportunity to consider some ways of protecting ourselves proactively prior to doing a live Zoom session if you plan to record that session and then share it with another class in the future, potentially violating FERPA. There are also some things you can do in post-production in technology as far as redacting names and even the video likenesses of students. That involves a little bit more technology and we could have some conversations um, privately to talk about how I could help you facilitate some of those um, redactions of student information to protect student privacy from uh, FERPA violations. So more to come on this, definitely check out the video. I have it linked in this video here in the comments on YouTube. If you want to take a look at that, we can have more conversations later. So, and really that relates to this second issue also connected to privacy. So the two issues that have come up um, specifically are legal opinions from the chancellor's office. And I'm reminded of some of the legal opinions that have come out of the chancellor's office in the past. There was one in particular, I wanna say it was like 15 or even maybe more years ago, where the chancellor's office gave an illegal uh, gave a legal opinion on whether or not students could be failed for plagiarizing in a class. And the interesting thing on this, and I'm not a lawyer, so don't take this in a legal sense, but the interesting thing about this is my sense is that a lot of these issues kind of reside at the chancellor's office in the legal department, as you can see here, the office of the general counsel. They get disseminated to campus, but then what we do with these legal opinions, I think, differs from campus to campus and from class to class. So I think it's a good opportunity with both of these legal opinions to really be proactive and to make sure that we're doing uh, our due diligence in our classes um, or even our counseling work or other work with students such that we protect student privacy where appropriate. So let's jump into this first one, and this first one in particular is related generally to online class cameras on policies. And so this is dated October 19th, and we'll go through the PDF here, and um, we can I'll share some links with this too if you want those. Maybe reach out to me and I could give you the uh, PDFs. I know the Academic Senate this week in October here um, will be considering this uh, particular issue. So the question is whether it is permissible for California Community College faculty to require students to keep their cameras on during live synchronous online instruction. Let's jump to the PDF of this um, legal opinion to get a little more sense of what's being discussed here. So I think the best thing here is let's just read the short answer which kind of summarizes the issue and we can go through all the sub points to get a better sense of what the opinion is and how we can adapt to this opinion. So the answer is, while there is no express prohibition against faculty requiring students to attend live online synchronous classes with their cameras on, 
an indiscriminate cameras on requirement risks violation of student privacy rights under the California Constitution and potentially implicates other federal and state privacy and civil rights laws. However, if there are circumstances where full audio and visual student participation is essential to instruction, a carefully tailored cameras on requirement might be appropriate. Community college districts should adopt policies to address these issues to ensure faculty and students are fully informed and that it respects concerns related to personal educational privacy, access, and equity. So I think kind of the, the, the summary point here relates to the word indiscriminate versus um, circumstances where participation is essential. So we can kind of play with that a little bit today. And the background here I think is really germane to this. So they're talking about how COVID-19 has necessitated social distancing and more online live synchronous video classes through Zoom. Uh, the discussion here is that many students are concerned about this and even colleges are concerned. It looks like College of the Canyons adopted a policy stating that they disfavor a, a general cameras on requirement. And some of the reasons for this could be some students lack cameras so they don't have access to cameras to even do Zoom. They have a limited internet connectivity, they have minor children with their own privacy concerns, or are homeless and lack a place to attend a class. Um, the cameras on requirement may also trigger an anxiety in students. And I think kind of the interesting thing here, and I just had a conversation with a couple faculty about showing a video in class and the implications of copyright issues in, in showing that video in a live Zoom class. The curious thing is if you imagine that we were teaching students in a face-to-face -face class, if you had a student who had anxiety about giving a speech in a class, obviously we could work through our disability services and our counseling staff to deal with that. But some of these things that have typically happened in a face-to-face -face class are not necessarily grounds for students having um, uh, an out or an accommodation. You know, there's a very um, tricky issue there about testing students officially through um, our disability services office with Kelly and the staff versus students who maybe have a general anxiety or don't want to do an assignment in a class because they have stage fright. And we can think back to our days where we didn't have a disability as students per se, but we had stage fright about giving a, a speech in a class. I remember, you know, being in that situation as a student. So many of our students have that. And what I'm trying to say is in a face-to-face -face setting, sometimes there are then less accommodations or legal concerns if they're not legit disability accommodations versus just generalized anxiety or students have concern about speaking up in a class or something like that. So it's kind of curious how the Chancellor's Office is defining a Zoom class as not face-to-face. -face. And I think some folks who work in the technology fields are actually saying, because the Zoom class is live, it is actually face-to-face. -face. We don't define it traditionally as a face-to-face -face class that happens in a physical setting, but there's presence there in terms, all, in terms of all of us engaging at the same time in that class. So that's kind of more just a technological or pedagogical issue for us to address in the future. It sounds like some colleges are saying though that specifically we should avoid having a general cameras on requirement. Um, this gets into the analysis and kind of balances um, some issues of academic freedom. So it says here, academic freedom is an important foundation of higher ed, it's not absolute. And may be limited by community college districts to advance other competing policy interests. And so to me, uh, this sounds like the idea is saying that even though there is academic freedom and maybe you want to require live sessions in a class, and I'm particularly thinking about a speech class, um, some of that may be uh, trumped by these other concerns happening legally. So we may be in a situation uh, as faculty where we have to think about ways around this and being more flexible in some of the requirements that we are um, uh, asking of our students with our classes. There's also a right to privacy under the California Constitution, and I would extend to that, you know, there are the FERPA issues as well. And again, you might just read through some of these, not to get into the legal opinions, but you might just look at what 
um, is being discussed here. Um, if there are some college policies that are referenced, like those of College of the Canyons, those might be interesting ones to look at. And as I mentioned, FERPA issues also come into play here. So definitely check out that video I offered recently. And then the um, there's a typo there. It's the Americans with Disabilities Act and the Rehabilitation Act of uh, 1973. So this is also important just in saying that we have to be very cognizant of cameras on requirements and how that might impact any students with um, anxieties or mental disorders. So there's certainly a lot very relevant here to moving towards Zoom and how that could be impacted by students with disabilities. And so here are, I think, kind of the main recommendations for this. And we can think about maybe having some conversations, coming together as faculty, and coming up with some solutions that might really work to deal with all these issues that they address, but still maintain that sense of um, academic freedom and those abilities for all of us as faculty to effectively teach a class. If you're doing live instruction, and the particular concept you're teaching in your discipline really benefits from all students primarily having their cameras on and speaking at the same time. Like if you were doing a performance theater class where you're doing live improvisation or you're doing particular exercises and if students didn't have cameras on and they weren't participating and they didn't have audio on, they couldn't participate. And if you were grading those assignments and then you are in a conundrum of how to fairly treat those students, but at the same time, make sure that they're doing the class activity that you're requiring, that could be a, a, a true challenge in trying to balance all these interests and issues. So here are the recommendations that they're making in terms of colleges and policies. It says here, districts should adopt policies strictly limiting or prohib prohibiting faculty from instituting cameras on requirements in order to protect against those issues that they relate earlier, uh, student privacy, academic freedom, compliance with FERPA, uh, disability laws, and so forth. Colleges should adopt a cameras optional approach that respects student concerns regarding privacy ac access and equity. Here are some suggestions, and you could read these on your own time, that might be um, effective in a class. And again, I think the uh, challenge with um, some of these suggestions is just trying to figure out classes in which, for example, using a chat feature for attendance and discussion could be great for some social science classes. If you're teaching a theater class and you're doing live video version of improvisation or some kind of theatrical technique of interaction, you can't do that necessarily with a chat feature because it's it's text only. So the challenge with this is video of the sort that we're doing with Zoom with with synchronous instruction is really effective at doing some of the things that we typically would do in a face-to-face -face class. Yet, because of some of these legal restrictions, it seems like the, the push is for us to only do uh, the optional versions of this. And I think probably as a college, it maybe will necessitate some revisiting of the EVE class because the EVE class has suggested that um, we want to have more live synchronous classes to have more of that spontaneous learning that we're so accustomed to having in a face-to-face -face class. But it's sounding like here the encouragement will be to focus on making that optional, which could make some challenges for grading if you're trying to do attendance, if you're trying to teach specific concepts in some of your disciplines with some live synchronous video techniques. And if you're trying to just have a really active class, because if you make video optional for your entire class, you might discover that a lot of students aren't even logging on or you have two or three people who are participating in a class and you know 75% of the rest of the class, because it's optional, is not participating actively. And I know even in the corporate world, there have been conversations about requirements of having video on and um, you know, is it going to be an actively attended and participated in meeting if the video on requirement is optional, if there isn't a requirement of having video on. So this one probably necessitates some um, discipline level conversations. And if you, any of you want me to set up trainings for your departments to have conversations, because I feel like this is an issue that varies from discipline to discipline. In social sciences, I think we can get around this in some ways using the discussion feature. But in some other classes, it may not be an option. So that's where we want to check in and maybe focus on some training. So more to come on this. I feel like it's something totally workable, but we just have, have to have a conversation about how to make adaptations in our own class settings. 
So the other issue is related to live synchronous online classes and real-time captioning. So this goes back to some of the trainings we've had. And if you're interested, we had a really good training with uh, Kelly and Treva. On, uh, this was back in March, uh, teaching talk number 14, student note-taking and strategies for students with disabilities. I was mentioning this in our PAC meeting today, saying that we've done some trainings on this and certainly we have more to do. Kelly obviously plays an integral role in this in her director role with the Disability Services Center. And so certainly we'll have more trainings from Kelly uh, about this important issue. Also, keep in mind that with things like YouTube, there's captioning available. With um, Zoom, there's captioning available. And a lot of that captioning, it tends to be really good in terms of the accuracy. I've done some studies of these uh, captioning systems, and they're pretty accurate in terms of the words. There's an occasional comma that's missed and so forth. In addition, reach out to Treva and any of the folks on campus who are working with the poker um, review. That's the peer online class review of your DE classes. And one of the key components there is a specific area in our rubric on disability uh, requirements and accessibility in your DE class. So I feel as an institution, we're doing a lot with this. So that's kind of the good news to pat ourselves on the back about. And so the specific question here is, is real-time captioning required in live synchronous online classes that we offer in the California Community Colleges? And the answer here is that an auxiliary aid or service is required if the class includes deaf or hearing impaired students. Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, the Americans with Disabilities Act, and related provisions of state law require auxiliary aids or services to be provided to deaf and hearing impaired students to ensure that they are able to participate in their educational program. In most cases, this requirement will be satisfied by the provision of real-time captioning and live synchronous online classes. However, community colleges must give primary consideration to the choice of aid or service requested by deaf or hearing impaired students and weight such requests against the burdens they would impose upon the college program. There's a really good background on this, so you can certainly read through all this. And it talks about the different technologies available, real-time, speech-to-text, open captions, closed captions, offline captioning. And so this will give you some information about that. This gets in, into the um, ADA and the Rehabilitation Act in the specific section that you can look over. And this talks a little bit more about the Americans with Disabilities Act. And so it's saying here that in most cases, it seems like what we offer through Zoom, what we offer through YouTube, um, Canvas Studio seems to be pretty good, sufficient to um, offer students effective opportunities to participate for those students with disabilities in their online classes. What it's saying here, though, there must be primary consideration. So if you have a student who reaches out to you and says, you know, the captioning isn't good enough in Zoom or in Canvas Studio. That's the point in which you make a connection to Kelly and, and Disability Services Office and you specifically ask, okay, we might need a live interpreter for this class. You could work with her and then get those services when needed, depending on when you're doing a live Zoom. Or another class that maybe even is pre-recorded, but the student needs more than what is offered in the captioning within Zoom, within Canvas Studio, within YouTube. So it's a great opportunity just to remember that all of your students have very specific needs. And so if those specific needs come up, reach out to the appropriate individuals, Kelly Greiner and others on campus, maybe some folks in student services through counseling who could give you the kind of help that you need to help our students with disabilities to ensure that they get the most appropriate, fair, and equitable instruction in their online classes. And to summarize some of this for us today, I would also point you to a recent Technology Thursday that I did, and it's a related video. You can certainly check this video out to get more information. It was on synchronous versus asynchronous learning and technology. And the reason I think that this is relevant to what we're talking about here is synchronous learning might be right in some classes or in some in teaching some concepts in your class, and asynchronous learning might be better for other concepts and other contexts for learning in your class. So it's really important, obviously, for all of us as faculty to determine what's the best approach, whether that is using the synchronous tools of Zoom and some of the other features there of live streaming, or using the more asynchronous tools like Canvas discussions or quizzes and assignments and other features in online learning. 
Obviously, you have to custom tailor those technologies, asynchronous or synchronous, to your particular class, discipline, and concepts that you're teaching. But it might be just a good opportunity to combine all of these interests and all of these trainings and concerns in a wider conversation about how we can best meet the needs of our students in terms of our learning, in terms of our goals as instructors, and also respecting privacy issues, also respecting disability and equity issues out there related to anxiety that students might have, and even issues of housing insecurity and the fact that not all students have even the basic technology to get online and to participate in some of those live Zoom sessions that you might be offering to students in your classes. So I think the important thing right now is to have all this on our radar. We can continue to have some conversations about how best to meet student needs and how also best to meet the needs of our own disciplines, our own teaching styles. We just had a uh, teaching talk on students and empathy, and we actually talked about this for 10, 15 minutes. So we had a conversation about how to deal with some of these issues because we know they're on the horizon and they're immediate and we have to deal with them. So I think let's continue to talk about these issues. Let's have more conversations in Senate. Let's have some conversations offline. If any of these issues are of concern to you and you want to schedule department training, let's talk some more and we can schedule some trainings or some offline conversations. So good luck with everything you're doing in your online classes and I'll be back with more videos like these in the future. Mm -hmm.